Okay, I'm dealing with a new Bible and new glasses, so <laughs> I'm not sure what you're going to get. I returned to my King James. I'm sorry. I returned to my King James. I, I, I was reading along in my, uh, in my trusted in, uh, uh, New King James, and I ran across something that I just went, oh, no. I, you run across all kinds of problems in these new Bibles. Uh, new translations, and I just couldn't deal with that. So I'm going back. So you have to get used to the these and the thous for a little bit, but that okay, that's okay. Um, I had a thought this week, and this is really what the sermon's about. It's one of these kind of metaphysical things that you get into. You're thinking these big pictures, and I, I ever was just sitting there pondering, what is sin? I mean, we all understand its definition is the transgression of the law, but I'm not talking about sins, right? Plural. We all know what that is. God says do or don't do, and to do or not to do is sin, but I'm talking about sin itself, like the big picture of it. What actually is it? What causes it? What happened? I mean, we know where it came from. We understand the story of, of Adam and Eve. But I, I was thinking of something different this past couple of weeks that really helped me grasp it. And it was the story of Cain. To just give me this bigger idea, when I thought about Cain, I thought about when I asked the question of what is sin. And I started there with Cain because it's like what made him, I mean, going from right after the creator's hand. Born of Adam, born of Eve, pure, perfect. Yes, Adam and Eve sinned, but I'm sure that they weren't very bad people after that. I'm sure that Adam was a righteous, righteous man. His, probably his whole life, but he messed up there. Maybe a few mess ups. How do we get from Adam to the very first born human being ever, from a woman to Cain, to grabbing something and murderously slamming his brother's head into the ground till he's dead? What in the world is that? Where did that come from? That is what I'm after. That is what sin is. Something happened to Adam. When he sinned, something broke with inside of him. It's not hard to see when we raise our own children, right? When they're little bitty and they're little cute and cuddly and we love them. And then all of a sudden they hit taller age and, and we see them do something. And you're like... Where did they learn that from? Where did they learn to cry and get mad when they can't have this or that? Well, where did they learn to grab something and put it in their pocket and hide it from you and know that that's not right? Oh, they're just a baby. No, nope. something caused that child to know that that's not right, but he did it anyway. What is that within the human being that is there? So it's safe to say that there is something broken in us at birth. Again, I'm not talking about sins, sinning. I'm talking about something within the human being that is broken, something in our genetics, something in our DNA that I wanted to talk about. The ancients started dealing with this about 400 AD, and they came up with a term, concupiscence. And that was just a fancy term that said that at birth, our DNA is mutated. Our genetics is faulty. When we're in the mother's womb, when we're being born, something is come, comes out that wasn't the way it was supposed to be, not the way that God designed us to be. Our DNA is messed up from birth. Uh, I don't know about you, but at least my mother thought so. Because I can remember being a little boy. I couldn't have been more than four or five years old. Um, we was living in Sugarland, and she put me in preschool. I remember I was small enough that I could remember standing up in the car. And, and one day, my mother got a phone call from the, the little school there and said, Mrs. Sneed, uh, you need to come get your son, Damon. She's like, is he okay? Oh, well, yeah, he's okay, but the other kid's not. And so my mother ran up there, and she got me, and the teacher had already given me, you know, those wooden spoons. I used to smile. I already got my smacking from my teacher. But this little boy took something from me. It was mine. It wasn't his. He wouldn't give it back. And so I attacked. I, like, got on him, and I was choking him, and he puked all over the place. And he was, I was just, like, out of control, four years old. <laughs> and I can remember my mother looking at me like, he did what? And he's like, yeah, Miss Anita, he's not allowed to come back. Four. 
Where do you get that stuff from? What is it in us that is so foul and so broken that at an early age we begin to do things? The story is obviously found in Genesis, this book that gives us so much about who we are and and what is wrong with us and what God wants to do. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 7 through 10, the short couple of verses, it begins to tell the story. It says, and the eyes of them were both opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord called unto Adam and said unto Adam, where art thou? And he said, I heard the voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Now, usually, most of Christianity thinks of this in such, I think, really almost childish ways. Is it true that Adam and Eve were naked and didn't know it, and they sinned, and and they're walking around, and they sinned, and then all of a sudden, (gasps) and they went and hid themselves? Is it really that simple? This is where sin begins. Something happened to them. The moment they sinned, something changed. Something very deep down took place. And in a a commentary that's going to help us understand what took place is where I'm going. I want to read this. As man came forth from the hand of his creator, he was a lofty stature and perfect in symmetry. His countenance bore the ruddy tint of health and glowed with the light of life and joy. Adam's height was much greater than that of men who now inhabit the earth. Eve was somewhat less in stature, yet her form was noble and full of beauty. The sinless pair wore no artificial garments. They were clothed with a covering of light and glory such as the angels wear. So long as they lived in obedience to God, this robe of light continued to enshroud them. The moment that they sinned, that covering of light that, that covers everything that God has ever created. The moment they sinned and disobeyed, now they saw themselves for what they were. Now that light, that beautiful light that enshrouded them was gone. And something, it was a, it was a, a harbinger, it was a picture of something within them that was also now broken Something from which now can spring forth a Cain. The deeper question is, what is that light? In 1 Timothy, we get a picture of this light. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 16. It says this, talking about God, and Timothy says, He's the only one that hath immortality dwelling in the light which no man can approach and to whom no man hath seen nor can see to whom be honor and power and everlasting amen so the light the unapproachable light is is associated with the character of god it's associated with his holiness his righteousness his power and whenever that nearness of god we see it in light in anything that is at one with god in right relationship with god that same kind of reflection that same kind of light is orbing out of them because they're holy they're righteous they're not disobedient they haven't ever sinned the light that we're talking about is the light of a righteous being That is the appearance that the Bible records of his holiness, his righteousness, his perfection as a being, as a God. That's the light that we're seeing from him, the light of righteousness. When Adam disobeyed, that light was vanished. It is clear that he disobeyed and it severed that creation, that holy connection with God. When his righteousness was gone, right, when his obedience was broken towards his God, the light was gone. And so was Adam's life, right? In Genesis 2, verse 16 and 17, God told him, if you ever sin, if you break this connection with me, if you disobey, more than just that light is going to disappear from you, but your life is going to be gone, and you are going to be now subject to death. But more than just death, when that separation occurred in Adam, something within the human race, it broke. 
And there is now a capacity within humanity, a, a mutation of our nature. And now we have a capacity for sinning and horrific sinning. Now you can have a child born the first generation after creation and he can kill his brother. Now you have an entire race of men that left to their own device. God had to destroy them in the flood because it was that bad. That is what comes out of this brokenness within the human being. And while Adam was in the process of dying, God allowed him to have children. Now we're going to get at some theological questions. Those children were also born with the mutation genetic mutation they were also born with broken foul corrupt natures and so forth and so on meaning the children like Cain were born without the covering of light they were born without that great connection and they too were subject to death Romans chapter 5 verse 18 says it this way Romans 5 verse 18 says, therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to commendation, to con condemnation, right? So all men came under the sentence of death because of the sin of the one man, Adam. He passed on to his broken, foul natures. And in fact, if you look in Romans chapter 4, Paul uses the analogy from uh, Abraham. When he talks about Abraham's loins, that they were dead. He talks about the deadness of Sarah's womb. Remember? In the loins of Adam, in the loins of Abraham, in the womb of Sarah, the human race is, Paul says, dead. So like, you remember in the Bible, God told him he was going to have a child. And Abraham's like, man, my loins are dried up. I'm an old man. There's no life left within me. And my wife, Sarah, she's an old woman. Her womb is dead. There's, there's no life that can generate from these two dead people. And Paul in Romans 4 says that is the human race. We are born in the loins of a dead man, Adam, and a dead man, Abraham. We come forth from the, from the womb of a dead woman, Sarah. We are born dead. This is the idea of original sin. Now, this is not a Catholic, people are like, oh, pastor's talking about original sin. Now, this is like not a Catholic idea. It's, it's, the, it's the idea that in Adam, the human race is dead. But this is not the argument because most of all Catholics and Protestants and all Christians believe that there was an original sin that caused the human race to be dead. That's, that's not the argument the issue isn't does adam sin the issue is this does adam sin condemn us all not just his particular sin but when adam sinned we all became cut off with him one side roman the roman church and eastern orthodox they believe no when adam sinned he passed on concupiscence the capacity to sin which condemns you when you do your own sinning but the protestant church taught in those days no the Protestant church taught, no, when Adam sinned, the whole human race was dead right then. It doesn't matter who's born after him. There can never be a righteous being to get out from the penalty of death. So the question is, are you guilty in Adam or are you guilty like Adam? Augustine was the first one to formulate that. And Augustine said in the 4th, 5th century, he says, no, when, when Adam sinned, then he gave birth or Eve gave birth who knows nowadays, right? <laughs> but when Eve gave birth, she gave birth from the deadness of her womb because she had no life in her. And so Cain was born condemned already. That is what Augustine taught. The Catholic Church came along for obvious, obvious reasons with Marian theology. They're like, no, 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 no. Yes, you're born with concupis concupiscence, but... You're not condemned in Adam. And the Protestant church came along in the 16th century and says, no, we are condemned in Adam. And that's Protestant theology today. We are guilty in Adam. And the reason why that is good news is because we had a second Adam. Amen. Right? Without that, if you believe like Rome, you don't need the second Adam. Because you have life within yourself, right? You have your own righteousness, your own immortality. You don't need a second Adam to keep life to you. 
But the Protestant church was clear about Romans 5 verse 12 and exactly what it meant. Romans 5 verse 12, therefore, as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. But Romans goes on and the the whole book of Romans chapter 5 is like, but in Christ, in the second Adam, we have life now in him and in him alone. Right, the human race is dependent upon him. So like Isaac, Isaac was born what? He was the child of, what's the word? He was a child of faith. He was born out of two dead people. Two people that could not give life. And when Isaac was born, it was a symbol of our life in Christ. He could have only been born by faith in what God has promised. And so we come from dead people. We come from dead Adam and dead Eve. But in Christ, we are children of faith and we have life again. And this is why we say that you must be what? Born again. That text, that idea that Jesus said, it makes absolute sense if you understand original sin. You have to be born again because your first birth really wasn't a birth. You was just a, you was stillborn spiritually. You were dead when you were born, and you need now new life. You need to be reborn and be born into the second Adam, into Christ, who is the only one that has life. Now, I'm doing some Bible studies with a couple of young people. We're preparing for some more baptisms in May, some rebaptisms, and some first time baptisms. And I'm studying with one young lady. Where is Chris Glenn at? Where is she? She's back there. Look, I've been studying with this young lady, and I really like her. And we got to this topic on repentance and what sin is, and she's young. And she, was, she did really good on the studies, and she understood theologically what it was, but, but she's a good kid. Her parents have raised her well. She is a, a righteous child as, well, as far as righteousness goes. She hasn't experienced a bunch of sin. She hasn't done, we talked about this, I said, you haven't done a bunch of stupidity and a bunch of nonsense. And she goes, yeah, I understand what sin is when he was talking about the need to repent, but she really doesn't have a whole lot to repent of yet in life. And by good God's grace, she will never will. And we was talking about this, but I, I was explaining to her about baptism. You still need to be born again because you are dead. It doesn't matter how righteous we are, how good we are. It doesn't matter how wonderful of people we are. This is why some people put off on baptism because they think, you know what? I'm a pretty good person. I do good things. I'm a pretty righteous person. It doesn't matter. You are dead. Even if you've never sinned once in this world, you still are dead by right being a child of Adam. Otherwise, Adam could have had some children that never sinned and we wouldn't have needed a savior, right? But that's not true even a perfect person that had never sinned from birth, would we still need Jesus? That's right. We must be born again, be born and to have life into Christ. And when we have life in Christ, John is not unclear of what happens to us. Right? In John chapter 1, Verse 7 and 9, something comes back. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. So in Christ, we get our what back? We get our light back. The light that Adam lost in Eden, we get back in Christ. In other words, he lived a perfect, righteous life without ever sitting before the light. He was the light of God. And if we're born again into Christ, we have that covering of light, that covering of perfect righteousness on our behalf in Christ alone. And we can be lit up again like God had lit the human race in the first days. One day again, we will be able to stand in the presence of God, but in whose righteousness, whose light? A lot of people in the world teach, oh, once you get to heaven, you'll be able to stand in the presence of God in your righteousness, in your life. Uh, Never. You are in Christ. This is why he stayed in his human form. This is why he's called the Tamid or the daily. He is our light for eternity. We are seen in him. 
We can never be without him for a nanosecond. However, the issue is that I still have this darkful, sinful nature within me. That's the problem. He's my light in the heavens. When God declares or he imputes that righteous life, that light to me in the judgment that covers me, when Jehovah comes, when Yahweh comes in judgment and begins to pass over the human race, my covering, my light is in Christ. I'm safe. But the problem is, meanwhile, in this world, I still have the dark, sinful nature within me that's broken from Eden. Baptism does not remove the fallen nature. It stays with us, according to 1 Corinthians 15. This corruption doesn't put on incorruption until the second coming. So I got a problem. I got light covering me there in the judgment, but what about the darkness in the heart today? Now you see where I'm trying to get to. The Bible teaches me that that righteousness that is Christ that's declared over me, that covers me, must also begin to shine and dispel the darkness within me. We call this an imparted righteousness. That which he has done for me in the heavens is an imputed, a declared, a righteousness that I received by faith. But if I've received it by faith, then there must be an imparting of righteousness within me, a dispelling of the darkness, a breaking up, a subduing of the dark sinful nature. In fact, Matthew 5, verse 16, which was our opening text, Matthew 5, verse 16 says it this way, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father is in heaven. Why does it say, let your light so shine, right? In other words, consider its source. Consider the light, the source of this light that that is covering you, that is declared over you, consider it and therefore let it in you so shine. That is a great light, but let it shine here in the heart, on the darkened nature, and then let it, let it flow out. This is what we call the process of sanctification, right? The process whereby God begins to turn back the broken nature. And that way at translation or at the resurrection, he can resurrect us without that thing, without that broken nature. But until then, there can be a subduing of it. There can be a lessening of it. And that only can happen in some very particular ways. People say, yes, yes, let your, your, your light that's got to shine in you is your good works that men need to see. The whole world believes in good works. And if we leave it there, then we're no different than any other Protestant or Catholic or Muslim or Buddhist, by the way, that believes that that good people do good works. But we in this church don't leave good works hanging out there to make it about some ambivalent thing. Though good works are important, but you have to read the next few verses about what are those good works. You ready for them? What are those good works that need to so shine out of me because I have him shining for me in God's presence? Listen to this verse 17, following that text. Think not that I come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. In other words, the way that the light shines on us and out of us is through obedience to God's law. The Ten Commandments are the way that God's light is able to shine and show us what corruption, show us what sin is. The whole book of chapter 7 in Romans is all about the light from God, his law shining in the heart, right? To show me what the dark sinful nature loves and craves and needs. And I can forsake it and turn to him for salvation. God needs us to have the light of Christ's covering demonstrated in obedience to his law. Now, you're going to run a good sermon. I'm already hearing some of you with this dragging obedience into it. Here we go. Obey. Well, that's what the text says, right? I met a young lady one time a decade ago, and she used to be Seventh-day Adventist. And if you tell me that, I'm always going to ask why. Why would you leave the church? And she started glowing, floating off the floor. I found Jesus. 
the love of Jesus I have found. And I commend her for that. Sometimes our churches can be a little loveless. But she went on about loving Jesus, loving God. I love, I found his love for you, and I love him, and I love him, and I found his love. And I said, but we've got that too. I've hardly go to an Adventist church that doesn't talk about the love of Christ. I've hardly been in an Adventist church in at least the past decade that doesn't talk about, in fact, that's all they're talking about now, right? I said, why did you leave? I, I said, Come over down here to catch him. We're ta- I tell you, we talk about the love of Jesus all the time. She went, and she kind of come down, and she got a frown, scowled up on her face, and she went, you Adventists, laws, rules, regulations, do this, don't do that. Don't wear this, don't eat that. And her scowl just frowned, and I went, ah. <laughs> and then she, she you know, I, I understand what she was saying, but I also understand what she didn't want to say. I can love Jesus and find God's love without obedience. Can I dwell in the darkness of disobedience and be clothed in the light shining, representing the righteous obedience of God? Can two walk together, at least they be agreed. Can light dwell with darkness? What does 2 Corinthians 6.14 teach us about this? Second Corinthians 6. Verse 14 says this, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath, and this is what I just quoted, righteousness with unrighteousness. And what is, what is righteousness? Righteousness is right doing. Right? The law tells me what righteousness is. Christ perfectly obeyed. That's why his righteousness is perfect. But what can, what could we, we could really translate this. What, is, what does obedience have to do with disobedience? Because that's really the idea. What has light to do with darkness? No, you can't. You can't be covered in the righteousness imputed to you, declared by faith, and then live a life of unrighteous disobedience. You cannot. You cannot say that, that, I, that I found the love of God, but now I'm dismissed from obeying his law. You can't do it. You will never find that anywhere in Scripture. Because once I have found him, we can say it this way, once I have found righteousness in Christ, my justification, that's my title to the kingdom of heaven. I enter the kingdom of heaven based upon what he has done for me alone, no works included. That is my title to heaven. But there also must be a fitting up process, right? My fitness to heaven is where sanctification comes in. It's where I allow the Holy Spirit access, and he uses the law to show me where I'm at in that. And Jesus in Matthew 5 shows us how deep the law goes. It is not just what's written in stone it's down to the what's in the mind and what's in the heart and what's in your character and that the law looked at in that way is going to expose the source of that foul nasty place where all the nonsense springs up in what we call sins and that is where god has got to deal with us sanctification is nothing more than than god turning on the lights but obedience look here's where i want to get at Obedience is much more than just doing righteousness. It's much more than just following the commandments. It is the ultimate expression of a loving relationship with God, right? That you cannot miss this obedience and love or that you cannot separate those two things. Jesus taught us, right? I have kept my father's commandments, he said. I have kept them perfectly. This is what Matthew 5 is saying. I have come to fulfill the world in Greek is plero. It means I have come to keep them in their infinite perfection, to fulfill them, to demonstrate the depth of which I alone am able to keep. I have kept my father's commandments I have come, he says, to do my Father's will. He went to Calvary in obedience to his Father. He walked in the commandments and the law of his Father. Because, what does he say later in John 17? To that love that I have for the Father, the Father loves me. And because I love the Father, I will obey the Father. He is our example in all things. Obedience, back to this, is righteousness. And Romans 13.10 says that love is the fulfilling of the law, or the fulfilling of righteousness. So if I'm obeying, it is a symbol of righteousness, which is a symbol of love towards the Father. And so for us, in Matthew 14, verse 15, 
Jesus says, like, I, I have kept my father's commandments because I love my father. And in Matthew 14, if you love me, keep my commandments. It is that simple for a Seventh-day Adventist. So why we keep the Seventh-day Sabbath, not because we're Jews or we're kooky or we're strange. It's the fourth commandment. It's right there. Keep the seventh day holy. Saturday Sabbath is the seventh day. I keep it holy because I love. It's a demonstration. My obedience is a demonstration of love, not salvation. Amen. Or the way that Ellen White says it, faith working by love, which is a biblical text. My faith works by love. Oh, how can you miss that? My faith works by love. That's why I'm obedient to God's Ten Commandments. Do I mess up? Do I sin? Yes, thank God. I have righteousness and I have forgiveness and I have justification in Christ when I do mess up. How else can we see it? Parents, you know this. Mary and I have been pretty upset with our youngest daughter as of late. Pretty upset with her, the choices in life that she's making. And all along, you know, since I've been back down to Texas, and, and you know, she moved in with us, and I'm setting rules, setting guidelines, setting things, and they're, they're not frivolous things. They're not things just to help me out because I need some help. There are things that, I, that I've given her to do over time because I knew that this is going to be training her. This is going to be developing character. This is going to help her with her work ethic. This is going to help her with her spirituality. And all along, over and over, she has been <laughs> not so attentive to my, what she calls, rules. And her life choices have not been so well as of late. And finally, it came to a fevered pitch not long ago. And she was going back, Dad, but I'm this, and I'm 18. I know you are, but, but Dad, Dad, this, back and forth. And I was so upset. I said, you know what? I feel like that you don't even care about me. Like, like I truly am feeling that you do not even love me, that you could care less about what I think or what I want. It doesn't matter to you. I can ask you to do this, and you won't do it. She says, Dad, but, but why, do you, why do you feel that way that I don't love you? I said, because you don't obey me. Right? Every parent knows this. A child that refuses to obey, you get but one signal from them. That is, you do not love me. You cannot love me. I told my child, this. it broke my heart. I said, you cannot love me in this kind of a disobedience. But when you have a child that obeys you, I see some of these children. When I see a child doing whatever the parent asks, I watch a little hezzy around here. If mama says something, he may cry. You watch him. He may cry. But in five seconds, he's happy and smiling because he listens to mom and daddy. And you know that boy is going to have love for his parents. I mean, when you can tell a child no sugar and it's right in front of them and they just walk on past it. That's obedience, and that's love. I want you to think about this now. I want you to think about this. As Seventh-day Adventists, we have three big texts that we say, wow, yes, we are obedient children to God, right? Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Revelation 14, 12. The other one was Revelation 12, 17. Revelation 22. Here are they that keep the commandments of God that they may have a right to the tree of life. And we think, wow, hallelujah. Man, we are a church that teaches obedience to the law of God because we love him, including his Sabbath. We don't disregard nothing. Yeah, well, we like to be like everyone else and go to church Sunday and be accepted and everything, be cool and do what we want. But God, Father says obey, so we obey. It's that simple. And it's, gee, yeah, you're amen, and I love it too. But God's like, hallelujah. I, I mean, these are commandment keepers. They, they obey by faith. So I think that I can trust them with this next thing. Because I know this church is willing to do whatever I say, obey me in any little way. So I'm going to give them something. I'm going to give them something very, very special. Revelation 19 I'm going to give them something very special that I, that I have given to my church down through the centuries. It's always been there in every church. In my last final church, the remnant church, one of the signs of the things that you're going to be able to know it's the remnant is this one thing. And it's really going to show how much they love me because it's going to call them to obey me in ways 
that are very deep, personal, and private. <laughs> Revelation 19, verse 10. And I fell at his feet to worship him, and I said unto him, See thou do it not, I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is what? It is the spirit of prophecy. Now, all through the Bible, it says, if they speak not according to the law and to the prophets, you got to get this. The prophets came through time. The law was written. Moses laid it out in the first five books of Moses. The whole thing is considered law. Then the prophets would come along after Moses was dead. They take a magnifying glass and they look at the word of God and then they would interpret it in deeper ways. They would flush it out and, and write about, oh, this is what this text means. Even this is deeper. And, and that prophet would die. And then another prophet would come along and he would take the scriptures and the word of God with a magnifying glass and he'd look it over. He'd look at the things going on with his people and he would write and write and write. We've always had the gift of prophecy. Paul says, despise not prophesying, right? Spiritual gifts, according to Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, one of them is the gift of prophecy. It's been in the church one of the signs of the true church down through the centuries. And the prophet's role, the spirit of prophecy's role is to magnify the word of God and break it down so we can have more opportunities for obedience. So that we can demonstrate our love in deeper and greater ways. And they always break it down into present truth. What was true at the time. How does the law apply to the truth for the time that we live in? And so, at the end of time, the seventh church, all right, the, the seventh church is the last church, the last church epoch, the last period of the church history, God does not fail to mention that I'm going to revive the spirit of prophecy in that church. And I'm going to give them opportunities to obey and demonstrate just how much they love me. For example... You know how many health texts there are in the Bible? Dozens of don't taste, don't drink, don't eat. All through from Genesis, right? The noxious, poisonous plants that rose up after the flood. It's like signs of sin. Don't boil them down, juice them, eat them, drink them in any way. Stay away from the noxious plants. Don't eat this. Don't touch that. In the Exodus, oh, you can eat this, but don't eat that. All the way down, even in the New Testament, like Peter's like, no, not so, Lord. I have never eaten nothing common or unclean. And so down at the end of time, through the spirit of prophecy, God takes a magnifying glass and he says, this is for my special people that truly will obey me in anything I ask because I know I can trust them with these kind of statements because it's there to help them. The health reform I was shown. So here's a quote from one of those spirit of prophecy writings, taking a magnifying glass from the book of Genesis in, in the message of health. I was shown it was part of the third angel's message. And it is just as closely connected with it as the arm and the hand with the human body. Tea, coffee, tobacco, and alcohol we must present as sinful indulgences and are not to be taken moderately but disregarded look at modern science what they say about these things one i was telling chris glenn this we was talking about the health in one of our bible studies and and she was like i was amazed to find out about coffee i said yeah do you realize one cup of coffee it 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 bottlenecks the blood flow in the brain by 40 percent for eight hours that's why people have they have this fog in their brain. They can't think, and they're, they're feeling all zipped up, but their minds, the, the place where the Holy Spirit speaks to is being benumbed. It's being the blood flow that, that helps get information to and fro all through the synapses, and all that stuff's got to be working. Caffeine restricts the blood flow in the brain by 40% for eight hours. That's got to be pretty bad, right? So the purpose of the health message was to take a, a magnifying glass and show us because God wants us, he knows that we're at the end of time when our bodies are at their weakest, when our minds are at their absolute weakest. The flame of God is about to snuff out of the human nature, and I'm going to give you something that's going to revive, it's going to help you. And because you love me, well, of course you're going to just can't wait to do that, right? But you love me, keep my commandments. Am I wrong on this? Or is it just the big ten you're worried about? 
And he would say this, right? Greater reform should be seen among the people who claim to be looking for the soon appearing of Christ. Health reform is to do among our people a work which is not yet done. There are those who ought to be awake to the danger of meat eating who are still eating the flesh of animals, thus endangering the physical, mental, and spiritual health. Many now who are half converted on the question of meat eating will go forth from God's people to walk with them no more. I think spirit of prophecy is not an opportunity for many to show how much I love my Lord and I will do. I know my flesh wants it. I know it does. Look, whew, I understand the taste of Texas barbecue. I, I get what a big cup of coffee, how it makes you feel. But, but it's, it's an opportunity to say, I trust you. I don't quite understand it, but I trust you and I want to obey you in everything. But for many, the spirit of prophecy has become an a, a opportunity for disobedience, which is a sign of a spurious faith. Oh, I know we're silent now. But do you believe we're living at the end of time? Do yes. you believe we have the spirit of prophecy revived to this church to help it? And my loving response to it should be another opportunity to serve my Lord. Another opportunity to say, what? Yeah, you want me to do what? No problem. Yeah, it's going to be a little tough, but it's a demonstration of my love. Because I trust him. He's my loving father. He wouldn't tell me not to do it just because it's going to make you miserable. He's asking me not to because he loves me. And if I love him in return, I will obey. That's how this stuff works. I know this new life, this new style of worship. I know. I know the sound of music is, is enticing to the human being. I get it. It feels good. It sounds good. But I'm going to raise up men at the end of time like Scott Ritzma. You've got to come tonight and watch Distraction Dilemma. It's like, like the last one. Scott Ritzma, Christian Berdahl, doing him. Have you ever heard of Little Light Ministries? Light Exposed in Darkness? I'm going to raise up some people at the end of time to show you the scientific like and spiritual dangers of music and entertainment television. I'm going to raise these men up, and I'm going to send them out, and I'm going to show to you exactly what it's doing to your mind that you maybe not have considered, things that you didn't think. And these men, man, they are so thorough spiritually and scientifically. You're like, oh, what have I been doing to myself? What have I been allowing in my mind that is separating me from my God? Lord, thank you so much. I am done. I'm in the garbage can. Mary and I, I know it. Look, I'm not perfect. Mary and I just cleaned out our movies again. Took a big garbage bag, and, and we held them up, and, and one of us, it had to be like a mutual vote. We both give the heavens up, push, in the garbage. Oh, oh, throw that away. And I started looking at the hundreds of dollars in movies of vile trash that separated me from my God. Now, if I love my Father in heaven, he gave it to me because he loves me. He says, look, this stuff's separating you. It's giving you bad ideas. It's doing stuff that you can't understand. Do you trust me, Damon? Yes, I do. I love you. Of course I trust you. Obedience says that's a true faithful statement. Disobedience would say, no, nah, you just got to say that. Who can tell God no, right? But obedience is a sign that I love him and my faith in him. My faith in him is genuine because I trust that he said it, so therefore I got to do it, sorry. Oh, if the heart of the remnant were such like David, right? Who in Psalm 119, we got to read it. Maybe some of you know it, Psalm 119. What does he say? Oh, how I, Psalm 119. Oh, these new Bibles. Psalm 119, verse 97. Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. In other words, David's like, I'm going to look at your law, Lord. I'm going to meditate it, and I love to find ways to obey you. That's, this is, here are they to keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. That commandment of God, it's got to be from a heart of love. Only the gospel can put that in your heart that you'll love it. The gospel teaches you you have a fallen, broken nature at birth, and it doesn't love God's law, Right? Right, for the carnal mind, it, the law is enmity. Right? The carnal mind is enmity against the law of God. It can neither know the law, law of God nor is subject to the law of God. But the man that's born again of the Spirit will look at God's law and love the Lord's law. It will find in the commandments life and instruction, guidance in what I need to ask forgiveness for, and a guidance for what God needs to do in my life to sanctify me. David said, I love the Lord's law. 
In fact, in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 1, listen to this stuff. You think we got it tough. Deuteronomy 11, verse 1, I, I love this. Therefore, thou shalt love the Lord thy God and keep his charge. So how do you love the Lord your God? Keep his charge, his statutes, and his judgments, his commandments always. In other words, it wasn't just the Ten Commandments, anything that I say to do. So all through the Old Testament, you've got exactly what to eat, right? What not to eat, what to wear, not what to wear, what to be involved with, not to be involved with, how to treat your neighbor. These minute commandments, laws, statutes, and judgments, all of them were expressions of my love and trust in Yahweh. Whatever he says, I do. And the more you give me, wonderful, more opportunities to show you that I trust and love you, Lord. And here we are in a church that has... Laws, commandments, judgments, and statutes. And so many people say, yep, the Ten Commandments, amen. Spirit of prophecy, ee. I want to dig in my Bible. I want to look through this thing. This is, I, I've talked to Miss Holly a time or two. You always see Miss Holly, she's always in her Bible. And she said something to me not too long ago. If I find it, I got to do it. Or it might have been a, a text she had. I was like, I find it, I got to do it. That's like the way. If I find it, I got to do it. Now, there might be some things and things we got to consider. We read something and go, okay, oh, Paul over here is saying, yeah, that we don't do no more. But you better have a direct, thus saith the Lord. You better have something that says, do not go to church on the Sabbath, but go to church on the first day of the week. You better find that. But if it's not there, Sabbath it is, Saturday it is, right? If it says don't eat this, then don't eat that. I'm looking, and then I can take the spirit of prophecy, right? The, the gift of prophecy given to the church with a magnifying glass and go, oh, man, that is so much clear. Look how deep that thought is. So, yeah, so this is how to even flesh that out even more. And so I should be willing to do that because I love him because I want to obey him. In fact, Daniel says this at the end of time, I am going to have a group of people God is going to have a group of people at the end of time in Daniel, the 12th chapter. It says this, Daniel chapter 12, verse 1 through 3. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to, every, to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that shall be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as to the stars forever and ever. Those that turn people to righteousness. Those that turn people to the righteousness imputed or declared to me that is Christ alone that will save me and to the righteousness imparted within me, to the light that covers me and the, to the light that shines within me. And the law is central to understanding what righteousness is. And Daniel says that I am going to have a people that are going to be shining at the end of time because they're going to be turning people to where real righteousness is found in the heavens and that righteousness working out in their life, shining to the world around them, uplifting the law of God, bringing mankind to obedience, never to disobedience, to a people that are going to find any way in any how to find a way to serve him, to please him. What does it say, right? To, to find out what pleases God and do what? Think about it. Find what pleases God and do it. If I can obey him in any way, I will. Remember what Jesus told the people. He said this. He says, you tithe mint and what? cumin you tie these little bitty things in the weightier matters of the law love and justice and mercy you don't do but these you should have done and not left the others in other words tithe your mint and cumin in other words find ways to obey god as minutely as he calls for just to do whatever he asks you and just keep finding ways to do it better look for text that says do it this way a little deeper because you'll find in scripture and you'll find in spirit of prophecy writings, there is always this. There is always the low road, the baseline, but below, below that is sin. Then there's the high road, the highest achievement. And then we are all somewhere in a continuum between these two ideas. True obedience is looking to always go upward to the highest idea. Disobedience is always looking to do the base minimum and you usually end up in sin. 
If you're starting there as the highest you'll go at the base, you're going to always go down. True obedience is true love and truly loving God. In our closing text, let's just find this. Our closing text, Philippians chapter 2, verse 8. This is, this is love finding its ultimate expression. Philippians 2, verse 8 says this, talking about Jesus and being found in fashion as a man. He humbled himself. Philippians chapter 2, verse 8. He humbled himself and became what? Obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Christ's obedience was so particular and so minute that it brought him even to his death. Can God's people at the end of time be so particular in their obedience that it leads them to their death? It leads them to the death of self, to the death of the flesh, to the clamorings of the flesh that's always wanting what God says, yeah, I don't want you to want that. So today, are there any of you that would just like to recommit to obedience out of a sense of true love, to him. Let's have prayer. Our Father in heaven, you know how difficult it is for fallen beings that are born corrupt, born with a broken nature that wants to disobey constantly. The clamorings of the flesh are so susceptible to the world and its influences, but you are calling us to obedience, not to be saved, not to prove anything other than that we love you enough to trust you even when it cuts against the grain of the flesh. There are so many things. Father, the very next thing that you want us all, and it's different for all of us, we know. The very next thing that you want each individual one of us to start obeying you in, I pray in just this short moment of silence. That thing that just flashed into our mind, we know what it is. If we love you, we'll obey you. Give us strength, Lord, to do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.